Breaking news, of course. Uh, the question was, what does the public think about the lockdown and the impact this has had on their lives? A webinar sharing the findings from the University of Johannesburg and Human Sciences Research Council was online in the multilingual COVID-19 democracy survey to answer some of those questions. Let's take you back there right now. Report household incomes of above 10,000 a month compared to 6% of black South Africans. Obviously, we, we do expect that given the persisting inequalities in our society. But if we look at the emotional experiences, only 29% of black African adults actually report irritation compared to a whopping 62% of white South Africans. So it's, there are sort of uh, paradoxes within this data, um, race being one of them, which I'll return to later. Um, the other aspect is obviously poverty status, and here I've represented it by self-reported poverty status. And you can see on most of, certainly these emotions that I've displayed, not all eight negative ones, there are quite substantial variances by uh, po poverty status with um, poorer citizens tending to report high levels of stress, fear, depression, loneliness, and anger. So very quickly, Obviously, you can get a sense of this volume of data that we're trying to deal with. So we have tried to simplify it as best as we can using both factor analysis and then modeling the results using regression analysis. The factor analysis showed that across these eight negative emotions that we looked at, they, they cluster into two. One is psychological distress, which clusters together um, the fear, depression, sadness, irritability. And on the other hand, it's the isolation clusters distinctively as the boredom and loneliness. So we model these two, we've modeled these two factors uh, separately to look at what are the drivers of these phenomena so that we can begin to think how the components might be mitigated as part of a response. So I'm going to show two graphs very basically that speak to that. This is um, the it's a, pre a visualization of the um, what's significant in our model of psychological distress. As Mark said, he, he kind of gave the game away earlier on. Um, hunger was the number one factor that jumped out. It was the strongest predictor. This is, again, perhaps no surprise, um, given that our survey has pointed to alarming. Uh, this is an alarming uh, problem. And the numbers which Karen mentioned, and, and indeed uh, Kate, around the going up to around the 50% mark correlates quite strongly with our data, certainly at the most recent round. Um, other factors that are clear from our data is there is the racial factor, and that's one of, again, points to this unusual paradox that white, Indian, and colored South Africans uh, report lower psychological distress than black South Africans on average, controlling for these other factors. Um, this might speak to some underlying resilience amongst black South Africans, and there is within the well-being literature in South Africa, a strong basis for that argument. So this is something that needs to be looked at further within the context of, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. There's uh, the gender factor still, still uh, stands out quite starkly. Um, also, uh, um, subjective poverty status, so poverty, gender, hunger, also, crowded accommodation is a critical marker of, of uh, psychological distress as well. On the other hand, uh, so the green shaded ones show that these are factors that actually reduce are associated with lower levels of psychological distress. And it speaks about low levels of knowledge as well as COVID-19 denialism. That is the feeling that the threat of coronavirus has been um, significantly exaggerated. If we look at the corollary of that, so basically, um, worry about um, coronavirus and high levels of knowledge predispose you towards worry and, and a sense of psychological distress. Um, so the hunger factor, I won't dwell on large, just show there are clear disparities, particularly on stress, depression, sadness, and anger um, in relation to the effect of, of hunger on people's um, emotional reporting of emotion, those emotional experiences under lockdown. So it is consequential. On the isolation, it's quite a different picture. Um, it, basically, age seems to be quite a critical factor. We see it quite highly on students and learners reporting, feeling more isolated. Particularly those 18 to 24 year olds as well are more likely to report this uh, than age, those aged between 25 and the mid 50s. Edu educational attainment also seems to matter. 
The alleged abuse of authority is more common amongst those that seem to uh, feel isolated, as well as lower levels. Uh, there's also lower levels of reported isolation. This is the green amongst women and rural residents. This is the teaser part. I just wanted to show what are some of the potential consequences of psychological distress and isolation. On um, Referring to Kate's presentation on institutional trust, we find that psychological distress and isolation both are negatively associated with trust in the president, the police and the army. It also has a pull down effect on um, support for lockdown, particularly un um, so we find that there's a greater tendency to report both either conditional support or opposition to lockdown, extension of lockdown conditions relative to unconditional support if you display high levels of psychological distress and isolation. And also in terms of future outlook, there's a feeling that, the, or certainly the, the multivariate analysis points to psychological distress and isolation being positively associated with a more somber outlook and the feeling that there's, the worst is still yet to, to hit us. Uh, and also that psychological stress, but interesting, not isolation, positively is, is positively associated with levels of worry about the COVID-19 impact on uh, uh, children's education. So the, by way of conclusion, the patterns among the data, such as the, those we've kind of highlighted in these few minutes, are really potentially powerful because they're representative of South Afghan adults, and they may therefore be persuasive and helpful for, uh, for democratically, democratically accountable authorities in their decision making. But it's important at the same time to say that the, their force is greatly enhanced by grand truths. So those are certainly the voices of uh, the uh, public that have come through in some of the open-ended responses that we've uh, uh, captured in our survey, but also other on the ground truths for, through practitioners and the lived experience of of, of uh, attempts to address some of these psychosocial effects. Um, I'm going to actually just leave these on the screen um, just to give you a flavor of some of the voices coming through, the kind of strong appeals, whether it be from health practitioners and what they're observing in the top quote, through to the voices of the public um, in some of the other quotes. This real sense of uh, the importance of factoring in mental health as part of the response. So although the scary, unavoidable world, uh, worldwide experiment will ultimately end, um, uh, it is important to recognize, as both our president and the South African Depression and Anxiety Group have warned, that it will require concerted attention and, uh, the, and the correct measures to be implemented. Mental distress and isolation, no less than the, the focus on prime socioeconomic determinants, must be part of the mix. So thank you, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Ben. And I think that was particularly powerful to, to end off with those um, quotations there that give some of the sort of real insight um, behind the numbers and, and how people are, are coping or not coping as the case may be uh, with, with lockdown. Uh, so I'll now move us to the last uh, full presentation for, for today before the, the wrap up. And that will be led by Professor Narnia Bowler-Muller, who's the Divisional Director of the Developmental, Capable and Ethical State Division at the HSRC. And her presentation is entitled The Paradox of Human Rights in a Pandemic. Over to you, Narnia. Thanks, Karen. I'm just going to try and screen share here. Um, can you see my screen? We can see it, yes. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, paradoxes and um, how uh, human rights is one of the paradoxes that we're facing during the pandemic. Um, just trying to move. Tabo, are you sharing the screen? There we go. Sorry. Um, so we had a pronouncement of a state of national disaster, um, but we should note that this does not affect the supremacy of the Constitution at all or the Bill of Rights. Um, it's not a state of emergency and therefore nobody is uh, deprived of their human rights. However, rights may be limited if considered to be reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society. Um, and this is a, a general principle of law, but even more so um, during this time. So the question is, what is reasonable and justifiable in the age of a 
a pandemic and which rights weigh more heavily than others? Okay, next slide, yeah. The, so the, we have international law uh, that allows us to limit rights, um, in particular liberty of movement when deemed necessary to protect public health and consistency with other rights. But there are also other rights that can be limited in terms of international law, including the right to freedom of association and even the right to a family life if isolation is necessary. So, a national disaster of this nature requires social distancing, quarantine and isolation, and therefore it would be deemed necessary for response measures to limit individual and collective rights. So there's been an argument um, uh, that civil liberties have been limited, but the question is, is this limitation reasonable? So we've had a limitation on the rights of movement, uh, association, assembly, trade, privacy, education, and even expression to some extent. Next slide. Even in times of national disaster, limits of rights cannot expand, extend beyond what is necessary and must also be in line with values. So the values of the Constitution, as articulated by the Constitutional Court, are dignity, equality, freedom, and Ubuntu. And I'll talk a little bit about Ubuntu later. Um, checks and balances must be kept in place as the executive remains accountable to parliament and the courts. The question is, where is parliament? Uh, the courts are coming to the fore now. Uh, chapter nine institutions must continue their monitoring and obviously civil society organizations and NGOs. And of course, government remains responsible for fulfilling um, socioeconomic rights during a disaster. So these cannot be limited. Um, obviously, the most important one that we're considering now uh, to save lives is, is access to health care, but food, water, shelter, and social security are rights that must continue to be fulfilled. So we all know that there was a, a case two days ago in the High Court um, where uh, the regulations for levels four and three uh, were declared invalid and unconstitutional because they were not rational. They were not rationally connected to the objective. Um, the objective being, um, in the main, the flattening of the curve. Uh, so, in other words, in order to ensure that uh, the virus does not cause uh, too much damage, uh, there had to be some uh, measures put in place. It should also be noted that uh, Justice Davis did not question the actual lockdown. Um, he questioned the constitutionality and validity of the regulations. Um, I must say, as a lawyer, I think that this was a very poorly written judgment um, and that it could go on appeal to the Constitutional Court, even though some good points were made. Um, in the next slide, there's just a, an important sentence, I think, that um, should be taken note of. So the objective is, if one is able to completely prevent the spread of the infection, sorry, is not, we're not able to completely prevent the spread, we must at least attempt to limit the spread or the rate of infection whilst at the same time maintaining social cohesion and economic viability. This is a really difficult balancing process. So, in, again, in the terms of international review, all these limitations of our rights um, must be of short duration. Um, in fact, the uh, state of disaster can only last for um, three months. So I think it's supposed to be ending quite soon. Um, on the 14th of this month, and we'll have to see whether the president again uh, declares a state of national disaster. Um, and it must not discriminate unfairly. The principle of equality is essential here. And the emphasis should also be, and I think both Kate and Ben mentioned this, uh, of participation. So communities need to have their voices heard and in particular those who are, are most affected and most vulnerable. 
and heed must be taken of hardship and suffering and the dignity of all to also general principles. So here's a quote. Um, I'm going to be sharing quotes throughout this presentation. We had open-ended questions in the questionnaire and received oh, many, many um, uh, messages to the president. Uh, the, the, please, Mr. President, endure. We didn't change the spelling. All citizens are looked after. We are personally suffering very bad and without work, I fear we might die of hunger because I cannot earn money and no one is helping us. The next quote, just be fair to all, be honest and make essay work. And I think that that essay work is, is a nice, um, way of saying that we want everything to work in terms of the country, but we also want South Africa to work for people to be employed. The next slide. So what surprised, what was surprising in terms of the survey was the number of people who are willing, in fact, to sacrifice their human rights in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We can see here, therefore, that there's quite a lot of empathy and altruism involved here, but also, in, in a sense, self-interest, because if we protect others, we are also protecting ourselves. 26% uh, were undecided, and only 8% um, would not sacrifice their human rights to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This is some human rights, not all. Next slide. So in terms of the phases, you can see it stayed relatively stable um, in all the phases. So uh, I think the average is 66% uh, um, from 68% down to 63% in phase three uh, were that people were willing to sacrifice their human rights in order to prevent the spread of the virus. Next slide. So what are the likely correlates? Well, this is quite interesting, the next two slides. First of all, in terms of gender, men have become much more reluctant to um, sacrifice uh, their, their human rights. Um, and you can see there's, there's quite a dip there. Whereas as women have remained relatively stable in their willingness to sacrifice. In the slide next to that, changes by age group. Um, sorry, go back to the previous slide. Um, changes by age group, you can see the youth are slightly less willing um, to sacrifice human rights. Um, but most importantly, 55 plus, um, the older people within our society, the drop has been drastic from 80% in the first phase to 51% in the third phase. So males and the elderly have begun to feel less willing to sacrifice their human rights. Next slide. Um, here again, uh, changes by population group and education phase. Uh, I cannot explain the anomaly around Indians in the second phase. Um, but what is very clear here is that the uh, white population um, has really lost faith in a sense. Um, and will are less likely to unconditionally support the lockdown and to sacrifice their human rights. And you can see um, there's almost a 20% drop there. So if you look at the pre, if you consider the previous two slides in terms of um, gender um, and in terms of uh, class in this one and age. Um, it's the older white men um, who seem to be becoming more dissatisfied, uh, but don't quote me on that. Um, in terms of education, uh, the more educated uh, people are, the more likely they are to, to be willing to sacrifice their rights, although that has dropped somewhat 
in the third, well, it dropped so much in the second phase. Um, so the next quote is about honesty. Um, so we wait weeks for actual details of the plans. People are hungry. Please consider making decisions for the South African narrative. We're not a first world country. Um, this respondent is worried about the, with, what the economy will look like in shatters. Um, and here the emotion part comes in. It is a future reality that makes me very sad. And then please respect our human rights. It seems that they are being sacrificed in the name of COVID-19. Next slide. So if you correlate willingness to sacrifice some human rights with sociodemographic variables, I think you come up with um, some results that, that are relatively um, obvious uh, in terms of um, the phases in particular. So uh, the, the main drop in uh, willingness to sacrifice comes from um, employed people in casual or peace work, um, as well as other, and those include um, self-employed persons. The opposite has happened with students and younger people. Um, and I, I would be very interested to investigate this further and to consider some of the reasons why um, students are, are sort of more willing to sacrifice now than they were previously. Next slide. Thanks for everything, but please, we are hungry. Here, yeah, dear Mr. President, I love you so much. By the way, the messages to the president were very differential and his popularity rate from levels one to, from phases one to three of the survey were around about 80%. You're a very smart man. You give us hope as the nation and for that, thank you. But we are hungry as our nation, not only hungry, but we can't afford to buy essential stuff and we don't have soap. Next slide. So people who trust the president are more willing to sacrifice their human rights than people who express distrust in the president. And as I say, the president's popularity has remained very high and other surveys um, have also reflected this. This does not mean, however, that a trust in government is high. Uh, we only looked at the president. Um, Councillors trust very low, as well as traditional leaders, where the trust is very low. Narnia, um, maybe about four more minutes. Thank you. I'll try and, and speed it up. Um, willingness to trust uh, and sacrifice rights. So trust in um, police was approximately around 50% across the three phases. And for, of those who trust the police, um, a large number are willing uh, to sacrifice their rights. You can see they're in phase three, it's gone up to 86%, even though there have been reports of violence within communities. And again, um, what's interesting is that people in informal settlements are more trusting of the police than, than people who live in other areas. The army um, is trusted more than the police. Sorry, back, forward. Um, the army uh, is more trusted than the police. And of course, people who trust the army would then be more willing to sacrifice some of their rights because they feel that they are safe and protected. Next slide. We trust you, Mr. President, but think for us. Don't be strict for nothing. We are hungry. The other quote is asking for help for the poorest of our country um, because of the, the issue of financial uh, support. And here you can see a level of desperation. Now it's difficult during this time. Most of, most of us must go to sleep hungry and wake up hungry. We need help. 
So the emotional experience that Ben mentioned, um, there were just two that really came out in terms of, of changes that, that uh, took place in terms of willingness to sacrifice rights. So the more scared or afraid people are, the more willing they have become to sacrifice their human rights. And, and that makes sense because if the virus is scaring one, one would want uh, more rules and not less. Um, however, the angrier people become, the less likely they are to sacrifice their rights. Next slide. So here comes the alcohol and liquor question. Um, please open the liquor store stores, Mr. President. It's our constitutional right to alcohol, um, which is which is very interesting because people do consider drinking and smoking to be a human right, although uh, not necessarily so. Um, and the second one, I salute you for making the impossible choice, but please, Mr. President, give us a bit of freedom and lift the ban on cigarettes. Next slide. So what's, I think, quite obvious here is that support for tobacco and alcohol sales um, as support for tobacco and alcohol sales increases, um, people become less willing uh, to sacrifice their rights and obviously more insistent on exercising their freedoms. You can see there the smokers are slightly more dissatisfied um, than the drinkers are. And now, of course, alcohol has been unbanned, so to speak. Uh, but the whole issue of cigarettes and um, and tobacco uh, is at the forefront of a lot of the, um, the debates in the media and in the public. Um, and I think that this has probably increased uh, since we ended up, well, we didn't end our survey since we paused our survey. Next slide. Two minutes, Darnia. Okay. Um, so what we can see on the one hand is social solidarity, where people see themselves as in interdependent um, and there we can look at core principles of coll collective action for the common good um, and that is why uh, we can see that, that, that some people are, are in favor of sacrificing human rights because there is trust, there's a feeling of reciprocity, I'm safe, you're safe and altru altruism um, and this can strengthen the fight against COVID as well as strengthen a rights-based framework. Next slide. But if trust is to be maintained, the establishment of platforms for collective action and citizen participation are necessary. And that's what um, Kate said right at the end of her presentation. So human rights are a paradox. Um, they can be seen as a symbol for liberation, uh, capitalism and individualism by some, so those who don't want to sacrifice their freedoms or rights at all for anyone. And then, of course, uh, some would be looking at social justice and peace and development and therefore be willing to sacrifice uh, for the greater good. Um, so the ideological power of human rights lies in the oscillation between law's order and the desire for a better world. Next slide. Um, so rights have a double meaning. They can be used by the privilege, but they can also be used um, to improve society or change society. And this is where civic participation comes into it. And um, as uh, the president has said, it is in our hands now. Um, and that is an important message. This is a, a quote that is uh, really covers everything and, and um, that I, I thought I needed to share in full. Um, and I'll just leave it to you to read. Um, it's, it's one of the quotes that came from towards the end of the third phase of our, our survey. Um, and you can see mention is made there about being uh, treated like children, being micromanaged and um, punished uh being uh feeling insecure um and questioning the point of the lockdown um and the end there you need to trust us more and beat us less 
Help us to continue to respect you and your decisions for the benefit of our whole society by showing your mutual respect for us and our civil liberties, humanity, and hard found freedoms. Thank you. That's it. Thanks very much, uh, Narnia. Um, obviously very uh, topical issue, uh, given the, the High Court judgment of this week. Um, I'm now going to give um, Dr. Uh, Yul Derek Davids, our Research Director at the HSRC, the unenviable task of trying to summarise and, and draw uh, our, our, you know, our learnings from um, today's uh, presentations and, and just in general from um, the, the findings from the survey. Um, Derek, I'm going to give you five minutes um, and I'm going to try and be strict now. Unfortunately, that's how we're going to have to leave that webinar. The question the webinar was addressing is what does the public think about the lockdown and the impact of the lockdown since it began? That one, uh, the webinar was hosted there by the University of Johannesburg. Interesting views indeed that came out of that. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of today's episode.